So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this talk. Thanks for the warm introduction. Um, so I'll be talking about solving MLOps from first principles. So of course, let's start with dogs, man's best friend. Who doesn't like dogs? No one in this audience, I hope. Wouldn't it be great to have a dog detection model that will point out in real time all of the great opportunities nearby to get to know and pet dogs? Even better, this can be a constantly improving model, right? gathering new data from dog lovers in the field. And as time goes by, it might even achieve sentience and, wait a second, why is it constantly pointing me to hot dogs? Who snuck hot dogs into the data set? When did this happen? And how do I get my pristine dog data set back? Uh, to prevent this catastrophe from ever happening again, I wish I had kept versions of my data and kept track of which model was trained on which data. Then I could track the first do hot dog incursion. But how would I achieve this goal? Should I save a zip file for every data set uh, every time my model is being trained? Should I buy a $1 million a year SaaS uh, that does this, or maybe I should just incorporate a not hot dog model to throw away bad, bad data before it, it gets in. There's so many options. So in this talk, what I want to do is share a five-step framework that will guide your MLOps tool choices, which is built from first principles. I'm going to use the concrete example of choosing a data versioning solution, as seen in the tragic dog photo incident. Um, and I think that the added value of this framework is that it clearly defines a structured process that you might have done in the past, but have hand waved over. Um, and it will help you put limits on your time and process so that you save those um, and, and avoid many tiers. And I'll touch on that later on. Um, I'll go over the steps one by one, explain them. And for each one, I'll share some of our learnings from performing this process for multiple MLOps tools, including pitfalls that we have and you might stumble on. Um, now, obviously, many of, these, of the points in this talk apply to classical DevOps tools or to choosing tools and solving problems in general. And that's great. It just means that even if you're not yet an MLOps professional or you're just getting into this and solving other problems, you can still find something useful in this that you can apply. Um, and to make it easy to remember, because it is five steps, um, I created this acronym, so which is DOGAI. Um, is that a coincidence? I don't know. You tell me. Um, so Sam already introduced me, um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'll say that I am really, really passionate about building tools that help machine learning teams work together. I am a strong believer in open source and the role it has to play in the world of machine learning. Um, and then I am the co-founder of DAGS Hub, which is building the GitHub of machine learning. Um, we, we do take uh, really amazing popular open source tools and combine them into a platform that makes them uh, easier to use and more convenient for teams. Um, and I'm also the host of the MLOps podcast. So that sort of answers the question of why you should listen to me. Um, part of what we do is evaluate these open source tools to decide which ones we want to integrate. And so we've really gone through this process many, many times. So diving into it, um, what is first principles thinking? So Elon Musk uh, sort of recently made this famous, but of course this existed long before him. And it, it, you might have heard the term, but let's define it by starting uh, with what it is not, OK? So we want to avoid thinking in analogies or in terms of I want what other people have. And, and the main reason for that is it is the best way to choose solutions that have the best uh, marketing, use the most buzzwords, um, or get what your friends need, but what your friends have, but not necessarily what you need. And so instead, first principles thinking proposes to start with the most fundamental truths underlying the problem that we're facing, and then the things that we sort of know with most certainty are true about what we're trying to solve, and then reasoning about the solution from there. So it's sort of a bottoms up approach. In general, I'm all for bottoms up. Um, and it may sound obvious now that I phrase it that way, uh, but surprisingly, very few people and very few teams actually employ this uh, in their day to day. And I'm not saying, like, later, after you finish doing this, um, asking what other people have and trying to search for analogies is not a bad idea. It, it could be a useful heuristic to find out the correct solutions. Um, but I think that one meaningful result of applying first principles thinking to what you do is that you're going to be more resistant to the marketing messages uh, um, or buzzwords, which in general I think is a net positive. So now for MLOps, right? 
Um, doing first principles, uh, or applying first principles to choosing MLOps tools is kind of hard. And part of the reason for that is what I like to call MLOps fatigue. There are so many tools to choose from. Everything feels really siloed with vague marketing messages and interfaces. And it's really hard to see how we can create a cohesive workflow on top of these tools. And of course, the nice marketing messages like iterate faster, all your ML needs solved, or get started in just five minutes don't make our life easier. Um, and the, this sort of mess usually leads to a process which is kind of like the four stages of grief. So let's go over it and tell me if this resonates. The first step is you start by doing everything manually. You email pickled models or parts of your data set. Um, and at the beginning, that is OK. Um, it is sort of a lean approach. And if you do this process manually for the first few times, you're going to get a much better first principles grasp of where there are actual friction points um, and what requires automation. But at some point, you might start noticing that you're losing work or time or sleep or just generally less happy than you should be over things that you could resolve with better tools. And then you get to step two, um, which is taking a look at side and realizing that there are a ton of tools, to, of tools to choose from. Now, everyone says that their tool is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and so you get into analysis paralysis. And at some point, you realize that you spent more time evaluating tools than actually uh, using them and building your ML platform. And that can be really tiring and depressing. So you give up and adopt the mentality of solving everything at once. So you start by ruling out any tool that doesn't solve any need you already have and any future need you might have. Um, you start saying things like, my problem is MLOps. I need a solution for MLOps. And the thing I think you should note about this uh, stage is that doing everything usually means being mediocre at everything. And so edge cases are going to pop up. And those edge cases are going to only be served by the best of breed standalone tools. And those are going to be then harder to integrate back into that all-in-one tool that you decided to use earlier. And in the worst case, this is actively going to lock you in and prevent you from solving the future problems that you will face. Now, basically, my underlying claim here is that ML work is fundamentally more experimentation oriented. So uncertainty is built into the system. Um, and, and everything is a bit more unpredictable than it would have been in other worlds. And so this can really be a killer. So then you graduate to step four, which is you're going to build it all yourself, right? Like, you know what you need best. So who better to build the tools for you than you? And the thing to note here is that this is the most resource intensive approach. You didn't build a GitHub clone, and you're not using a cloud service that you uh, uh, started from scratch. So why does it make sense here? Now, since this is not your core business, I would also argue that the result in many cases is going to be worse than the alternative. Now, if you have a huge dedicated and internal ops uh, team, then maybe it's doable. But going into the assumptions we're going to make about the problem that we're facing, the first one is going to be that you are not Google or Facebook or Meta. Uh, if you try to solve everything in advance, you're going to need 70 DevOps people for every data scientist, for every single data scientist doing linear regression. And of course, that's not what we really want here. It is tempting to think about the millions of requests your model is going to receive every second. But if it hasn't received one request just yet, you might as well start by solving for that. And this approach, uh, if you do adopt it, is the opposite of first principles thinking. You're basically assuming that your team is analogous to a data science team at Google um, and building what they have. Now, if you don't know where this uh, phrase is coming from, there's a really good blog post with the same name, that you are not Google, which I uh, recommend. The second thing is MLOps is still in its early days. Um, we are living on the cutting edge of innovation and technology, and that is awesome. Uh, it means you are all working on really interesting problems. But it also means that many of the tools and workflows that we're using today uh, might not be relevant or as relevant in the future. And so if you only take one thing away from this section, um, it should, and, and remember it, it should be that it's all a matter of trade-offs. And we're trying to balance roughly, of course, you can add additional things here, but roughly three things. First is getting to production at the relevant scale. Second is saving time and money. And third is building a future-proof system. Now, everyone is going to prioritize differently. There's no one set of, uh, of ranking that makes sense for everyone. But it is important to pay attention to all three. Um, and 
in most cases, a bad decision is better than no decision at all. So I would also remember that. So that's what we're assuming about the problem. What about the solution? First, we want to be problem focused, right? So this is similar to what I'm saying about first principles thinking, but the idea is you start and focus on the problem that is at hand and not about the features that you think solve for that problem or treat that problem. Um, now, in a very practical sense, this is going to limit the search scope for tools in two main ways. The first is maybe there are no tools for the problem that you have. That is uh, possible, right? And in that case, you're going to sort of avoid all of this uh, 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 grueling process and just go ahead and, and build it yourself. The second thing is you are going to be less distracted by buzzword and marketing messages, which again is going to mean that you need to look at less tools than you would otherwise. Point number two is um, you would want to start by building a simple pipeline that gets you all the way to production. Now, if you think about, uh, uh, about this from first principles, like which parts of this process are recurring often and might need uh, automation, uh, these things could be you know, uh, data labeling, maybe deployment, uh, maybe mo the model training, or something else. But it is going to vary wildly and de depend on sort of your sp the specifics of your use case. Um, third, and this one is maybe um, uh, the most uh, counterintuitive, or was the most counterintuitive to me, is in many cases, machine learning tools are inspired by equivalent developer tools. Um, and that makes sense because DevOps has existed for a long time, and there have been a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears poured into uh, building the, these tools, right? But the workflow is still fundamentally different. Um, and, and first and foremost, it's more experimentation oriented. There's also this data thing, which isn't as prominent in, in the world of software development. And so the scale and cost of handling data put a lot of constraints on the workflow so that a lot of the normal DevOps methodologies might not be practical. Uh, to give a concrete example, imagine your CI CD pipeline needs eight GPUs and 48 hours to train uh, for each Git push. push. Um, and that means that the tools and solutions should provide an ML twist where they actually think about the differences uh, um, as a first class part of what they're doing. Last but not least, uh, because the field is still fuzzy, I would argue that open source software is even more important than it is in other areas. So if you go ahead and buy an Oracle SQL server, you pretty much know that it's going to be plus minus the same thing with the same constraints in a few years. And even if you want to shift to a different SQL provider, um, that should be relatively easy, assuming you stuck with vanilla SQL. In machine learning, the flexibility is extra important because the infrastructure is constantly changing. And you never know when you're going to need that escape hatch of diving one layer deeper and integrating with a new data source. And that is extra valuable here. So I, I would argue that there are very few SQL-like established conventions in the world of machine learning. You could argue things like O and NX are, are that, but again, they are few and far in between. OK, so that's sort of the, the um, prologue to all of this. Let's talk about the concrete example. So we talked about uh, um, the sort of first principles. We talked about the hot dog incursion event. Um, and so we want a solution for something like data versioning. And to get to that, we might say, I want to version my data. But what I'm going to claim is that this is actually bad form. Uh, and that will lead you down the feature path. And so what instead you want to say is that your data is regularly changing, and you want to be able to revert back to an older version uh, for disaster recovery. Now, clearly defining the goals that you have will help you prior prioritize uh, what's important. And so the first step is defining the problem. Um, maybe when you go through this step, you're going to realize that the problem uh, isn't a high priority and you should focus on other things now and get back to it later. Uh, or maybe you think that your problem could be best solved by implementing some data versioning solution, uh, but in fact what you need is just to format your data in a different way and add timestamps. Um, and that will provide an easier but as effective solution, and that's okay. So a few things, uh, or sorry, to make my point, here are a few options. Um, for problems that data versioning might solve. Now, each one is going to lead to a completely different set of priorities and possibly different tool choices, but all could be considered uh, a data versioning from a sort of non-first principles title. So pinpointing which one of these three or something else that you have will really affect the end result that you get to. Two pitfalls we see here. 
uh, that are very common. The first is doing this in a post hoc way. Um, you choose the tool according to the feature and then describe a few problems so that you can check the box of saying that uh, you thought about which problem you're trying to solve. Um, don't do this. I think it's, it's pretty clear why not, but if you actually want to go through this process, you should treat this first step as sort of the most critical one and, and start from the problem. The second thing is if you looked at the slide before and you said, well, I, I have all of these problems, um, then if all problems are equally important, that usually means that nothing is. And you're just going to push yourself to analysis paralysis because it's going to be hard to prioritize. Um, and so if you're not sure which is most important, it either means you're already going down the feature path um, or you didn't think enough like a product manager um, uh, and sort of correctly identify the needs and the pains that you have. Or uh, you might be uh, making the mistake of thinking you are Facebook. So all of these are bad, and we'd like to avoid them if possible. Um, but now that we defined our problem, now you're going to be tempted to say, well, we need to get a flexible tool that supports data versioning so that we can revert in case of an emergency. But I'm going to stop you again and say that this is going to, again, make you significantly more likely to get into analysis paralysis. And what you actually want to say is, we need a tool for tabular data that supports add-only changes, works with MySQL databases, can support 100 gigabytes to 10 terabytes of data, and we're only going to need to revert every few weeks. And so what I mean by this is that the next step of the process is outlining problem parameters. Or in other words, we're going to dive into the details of the problem that we have and, and sort of lay out the criteria and requirements that we're looking for in a solution. And so to do this practically, um, because that might have sounded bombastic, we're just going to ask ourselves a few questions. So first and foremost are problem specifics. So in the case of data versioning, we're going to ask questions like, are we working on computer vision or our data is tabular? Do we expect the data to be immutable, additive over time, or could it be changed retroactively? How much data are we talking about? And the answer here, again, shouldn't be three orders of magnitude more than you actually have right now, because you are not Amazon. The second set of questions are questions that are sort of organization specific. So is our team using a database that is a must? Are we using other tools that are sort of ingrained into the company and this new tool that we're introducing has to sort of play nicely with? And I'm, I, I would argue that organizational constraints are the most important out of all of these uh, uh, questions because many times they dictate the most uh, uh, crucial limitations and the largest constraints on the search space for the solution. So we might want to use a certain tool, but if it doesn't work with everything else the company is using, we're going to give everyone a bad time. The last, question, the last set of questions we're going to want to ask is, who am I? Or uh, in a more practical sense, are, am I a sort of shell scripting wizard or a sysadmin with little ML experience? And of course, I'm not talking about each one of you in the audience. It could be the average person in the organization you work for um, or the company culture itself. And this might add a lot of counterintuitive considerations and priorities, like are we trying to prioritize for flexibility or ease of use, right? Last one is a tip for how to do this. So I'm going to iterate this, uh, reiterate this many, many times. Uh, writing stuff down is important. And so one helpful way to define problem parameters can be through a user story. So it is usually an internal user in this case, um, or sort of a workflow that includes this problem that you're facing. So it, for, for example, it could be as a data scientist, I want versions of the data I'm using to train my models so that I can debug problems that occur in production. And that might lead to realizations uh, like, are we going to version the database directly or just the outputs of queries that we're using to training runs, uh, using in training runs? And ideally, again, you want to document this and share this with your team. Uh, your assumptions might be wrong, and people, uh, other people have experience, could correct you or add things that you didn't think about. And, and, and the sub tip for this is you want to be careful about design by committee. Right? It's very easy to share it, and then everyone has their own opinion, and then you get lost uh, again and back to analysis paralysis. So the idea is to ask for input, but to try to keep it at the layer of facts and first principles uh, ideas about this problem. So an example for that could be, you said our data is 100 gigabytes to 10 gigabytes, but it actually, uh, to 10 terabytes, but it's actually petabyte every day. So you're, you're wrong in the core assumptions that you're looking at. Okay. So enough definitions, right? 
Um, we define the problem. We define the, the sort of criteria and requirements we have. And so now that we've gone through all of that, the next step is going to be to roll up our sleeves and build a tool we need from scratch, right? We're just going to open up Vim or Emacs, whatever you like, and then hack away. You got this. Of course, I am joking, but the point I'm trying to make is as engineers, as builders, um, we lean towards building, and that's, that's OK. Uh, I, I'm biased. I'm guessing everyone in the audience is biased as well towards that. And it is really great to build something cool. And it is e even better to see other people using the cool thing that we built. Um, but in most cases, reinventing the wheel is not the right approach. And so the actual next step that I recommend is Googling the problem. Um, this might sound tri trivial, but you would be surprised how many, people, how many times people spend five minutes searching for existing solutions before deciding that they're going to spend months over months developing something uh, uh, internally. And so I want to go over a few tips on how to make this process uh, more effective. Um, and yeah, Googling should be a part of everyone's CV. Um, so the first thing we want to do here is be really self-aware about the need to budget uh, responsible or reasonable, sorry, amount of time, at least several hours to research this, uh, the existing solutions. Now, we want to limit time in both ways, right? Like, make sure that we're not just spending five minutes and then going on, a, uh, on like a huge build spree for a few months. But on the other hand, we want to set a maximum amount of time so, again, we don't do get into analysis paralysis and there's too many things to look at and everything. Um, and I think that the first dividend from the process so far comes at this step. We've defined the problems. We defined the, the parameters. Now we want to search for those. Um, and so I, I guess maybe one more point about that first one is notice that I'm talking about searching at, at the meta level, right? So we want to search for the terms uh, uh, that we defined, not for the solutions that we estimate we're, we're going to need. Uh, the second thing is, again, write things down. Build an info page so that other people in the organization can review it, add tools and ideas that they have, and sort of have a documented discussion. Um, it, again, if you're working alone, you're the first MLOps uh, um, engineer in your company or something like that, uh, you might be tempted to say, well, I know everything. It's in my head. But remember that the most common type of collaboration is with, with your future self. So even if you don't have team members, you should write it down. Um, as I sort of alluded to, it is very likely that one of the first thing you, things you learn when you get to this point is that you're searching for the wrong keywords. And that is sort of why we go through this step. So what we're actually going to do as part of this is read blogs and forum posts and uh, um, sort of other content pieces where the idea is not just to learn um, sort of what tools are we looking for, but expand the terms that we are using to look for those tools. Uh, and then when we do that, we sort of search again, right? And so part of this is asking friends and colleagues and random people on Reddit about the problem that you're having. And we're, we want to use this, again, as a tool to discover keywords. Now, uh, important point here is in the world of machine learning, uh, many communities and tools, unfortunately, don't have a strong Stack Overflow uh, um, uh, presence. So if, if this was a DevOps talk, I would say, like, go to Stack Overflow. But I find Reddit more effective. Uh, for ML-related discussions. And this might be counterintuitive to some people. Uh, here are a few real examples from data versioning-related uh, um, discussions on Reddit. And the point you should take away from this is you want to be as specific as possible on Reddit so that you improve your chances of getting uh, relevant answers. And to do that, you want to actually provide the problem definition and parameters that you defined earlier. And understand that the main goal is to get as many as, as, uh, responses as possible. So if someone gives you sort of a dead-end response, like, oh, you should just use tool X, then you should comment on that and sort of ask, why are you recommending this? In which edge cases does this not work, right? And this is a really great way to build a list of keywords that you're going to, again, feed back into Google later. Um, and another note here is you might use searches like X tool comparison, so in this case, like data versioning tool comparison, um, which will lead you to blogs that compare solutions. We have one of those blogs, right? And what I add, uh, uh, recommend here is just uh, to check the incentives behind those blogs. I think that they should be uh, sort of explained up front. And it's OK if a vendor sort of provides uh, an overview of existing tools. Obviously, they are biased, and, and that's OK. It doesn't mean it's worthless. It just means that you need to sort of uh, caveat that in the right way. 
Um, so here are a few concrete examples. Yeah, nice animation. Uh, a few concrete examples of things you might Google for um, as you learn more and fine tune your uh, keyword search. Now, I'm not saying that the first term at the top is, is bad. It's just better for a Reddit uh, post uh, and less, less uh, successful at, on, at Google. Um, so yeah, so that's step three. So at this point, you should already have a short list of the tools uh, that, fit your, that, that fit the bill, right? And so the next step is going to be sort of the natural part, right? We're going to go through the Hello World tutorial of each and every one of these tools um, and try them out. And I think that even here, we can do better. Now, ideally, we want a list which is prioritized, so you already uh, put some thought into which tools are more likely to solve your problems than others, and you want to go over that list in the way you prioritized it. Um, but I think that sort of there is a methodical way to do this, uh, which is sort of we go through pre-technical evaluation. So ideally, you want to rule out tools that you, um, that you want to try before you try them. Uh, so gauging the quality of the tool, how much support it has, how robust it is um, before you st install it and play around. Then we want to sort of make sure that we understand the operating principles behind this tool uh, to a certain extent, and I'll explain why in a moment. We want to do some hello world examples, that's OK. And then we want to stress test. Um, and I think that another dividend from our process so far is that we're going to uh, know exactly which dimensions we want to stress test the solution on. And also, we're going to have a shorter list than we would otherwise have. So we're at the point where we're evaluating solutions. And so let's go over those sort of four steps uh, of the process. So usually, especially when we're talking about open source solutions, people go directly to the GitHub stars. Um, and, and sort of you, you might look at these two tools and say, well, tool B is better than tool A because it has uh, more stars. But obviously, this is not the best indication. So latest commit time, uh, latest release time, number of contributors, number of forks, PRs, and issues are arguably much more relevant than the number of stars. And for issues, uh, what is the speed of response to issues and PRs? Um, not just the sheer number, right? Like if there's an issue from four months ago that got no response, that could be a red flag that this tool is either no longer supported or that the support is not as fast as you'd want it to be, um, even though, of course, open source people are doing a lot of things for free. So uh, take it at your own risk. But I think that this is really important to think about and not just say, well, this tool has more stars than the other one, so that's the one we go with. Um, operating principles. So a lot of times people say that you should sort of totally understand the operating principles behind the tools you use, especially if you're an ML ops or DevOps engineer. And I think that the main point behind understanding operating principles is not necessarily understanding how the tool works, but understanding what the tool creators care about. Um, and so I'll give a concrete example with a tool I'm very familiar with, which is uh, DBC. So you could argue that the operating principles there are it uses Git to manage pointers to data files that are then stored on remote object storage. And it supports almost any type of object storage that you might use. Now, does that fit your needs? Well, it depends, right? The simplest example is that if, you are, if your entire data is stored in a MySQL database, then it might not be the tool for you. That doesn't mean that the tool isn't good. It just means that by understanding the operating principles, we understand that it wouldn't apply as much to our use case. Um, the third thing here, right, uh, is the hello world. And I think that people have a tendency to focus on how easy it is to get started. But I would argue that the ease of the hello world doesn't matter as much. I know this might be controversial. Um, if it is a good tool and it takes you an hour to run as opposed to two lines of code, then that's OK. The question is, how good is it after it's set up? And the importance of defining uh, the problem criteria, the problem parameters, is really important here. So if we define the problem to be reverting to an, old, an older version in case of a disaster, then making sure that that sort of doesn't introduce a lot of burden to day-to-day -to -day work is really important. But maybe if our problem definition was different, then a burden on day-to-day -day work makes sense because the, the dividend or the return from that uh, is much larger. Last but not least, stress testing, right? So if you define problem parameters uh, uh, properly, then you will sort of know in which dimensions the problem that you're looking at is unique. And you want to make sure that the tool that you're going to choose is going to address those uh, sort of uh, edge cases uh, uh, properly. 
And so to give a concrete example, let's say I'm doing computer vision, and my data is in the order of magnitude of thousands of images. It might be useful, if I'm sticking with a DVC example, to use DVC with 10,000 of, image, 10, of images uh, to stress test, right? And I'm going sort of one order of magnitude more than the data that I actually have, because I'm not yet Tesla. Um, and in another case, we might want to check if this tool that we decided to use supports streaming data. Now here you might ask, well, what if I don't have my data set yet? A lot of times we're setting up these systems and we don't have access to the real world things that we're going to work with. And so I think that in that case, the, in, in this concrete example, I'm going to write a script that generates random images. Those could be noise or scraping images from Google um, and then using that as an input. Um, and this is also a really great uh, uh, idea to sort of test the compute costs of using the tool that you're going to work with. So if you built that function, you can then say like, OK, I want to create a curve to see how fast it is or how efficient it is with 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 images, right? Um, so that's stress testing. And hopefully by this point, like if you've gotten to the point that you stress tested the tool, you're probably very close to deciding that this is a tool that you actually want to um, integrate. And so we are now ready to start integrating this new tool. And this is probably a more intuitive step, but I'll go over, again, a few pitfalls and, and points that I think are important. So you might be tempted to go sort of all in and say, well, I went through all that trouble, right? I, I Googled for a few days, and then I stress tested a bunch of tools. And I just, like, let me integrate this, right? So let's put it in all the projects for all the teams, whatever it is. Um, and also drowning in success criteria because you want to know that this is ROI positive. Um, but again, I'm, I have a few recommendations regarding this. So the first one is you want to start simple. Um, one project, one user, one unit of whatever it is sort of the integration requires. You will learn so much from that first round. And doing it this way will, will sort of make you faster in the long run. Um, this is also usually where people say that you should define clear criteria for success so that you can measure the cost benefit of using this tool. And I agree in theory, but in practice we're living in the real world and many times you don't know how to define clear success criteria. Um, and so you, you just don't want to let this get you back into analysis paralysis after we went through all that trouble to avoid it. Now, if you can define clear success criteria, you should totally do it. But if you can't, a good way to approach this is just time boxing the integration, saying, like, we're going to work with this for three months and then regroup and decide what to do next. Um, and assuming you started simple with one project, one user, uh, one unit, then that shouldn't have too much sunk costs in the process. So you can actually make this uh, uh, decision in an educated way. Last but not least, it is so easy to not review this, right? You go through all that process, you just want to integrate, and then it works, which is great, uh, or it kind of works, which is also great, um, and then you, you're like, you're on to the next thing. But I think that uh, going through the review process is really important for two main, uh, um, in two main aspects. The first is you might have introduced bottlenecks, which need to sort of feed into this next evaluation process that you're going to do. So you solve data versioning. Maybe that now affects how we do, I don't know, experiment tracking or monitoring or something else. So you want to be aware of the bottlenecks that you might have introduced into the system. And the second is, this is a process like any other. And if you do this on a regular basis, you're going to get better at it. But you're going to get significantly uh, uh, better at this faster if you do review the process. And so what I recommend here is when you start this process, right? you're writing down the problem, and you expect to finish the integration at a certain time, set the date for the review meeting then. right? Don't wait until after the integration is underway and you have a bunch of other things to do. Awesome, so we made it, you survived. Um, to summarize, we reviewed a process that consists of five steps to evaluate MLOps tools, uh, um, or, M or to solve MLOps problems, rather, uh, from first principles. And I think that for each step, I hopefully shed some light and gave some tips that you can actually apply, uh, and you, so you avoid sort of the pitfalls that, that we suffered from. Um, and I think that, again, this is much more widely applicable than just like MLOps properly which is great. You can share this with other people in your organization working on other problems. And again, I think that the sort of structure that we introduce into this process uh, that we might have done in a hand-wavy way uh, is really valuable. 
you can now sort of enable maybe more junior team members to do this process and get to consistent results. Um, and of course, you're going to limit the time you spend on choosing these tools. And I really, really hope you avoid analysis paralysis, uh, save time, money, and tears. So again, this is the acronym to remember. Um, and that's it. That's my talk. I really appreciate you joining it. Um, and you can follow me on social media if you like this content and you want more of it. And I'm happy to take questions. I have five minutes, right? Yeah. I'm just picking up on something you talked about in terms of not being Google and not being Meta and solving the get one hit problem versus the million hit problem that you might sure. have. I think a very real problem is you, know, you get a pile of money and you say, OK, you're going to fix this problem. And that's all you get. So you, you have the opportunity not just to fix the problem in front of you, but fix the problems that might arise. So you actually have to do it because you don't get another chance to do it. So how do you balance that? How do you balance the problem in front of you versus the problem that might arise if you only have one chance to fix it? So are you asking this from the perspective of someone uh, like building the ML platform within an organization? or yeah. building? OK. Um, at least my perspective here is that there are enough sort of fires in front of you that need solving that the fires in the future uh, can be left to the future. Now, I did talk a lot about sort of finding the dimension in which you might be equivalent to Google. So it might be that in your specific case, you are going to start with 1 million requests the first day that your model is in production. Um, and, and, and that's OK. The, the usual way this problem plays out, and, and we've had these conversations many, many times, is when you assume that problems that you don't have are problems that you have. Um, and I think that that's sort of the thing that I'm advocating you avoid. So again, it, just to piggyback off the request example, if you know for a fact, for some reason, I don't know, maybe you're the MLOps team at a, a huge bank, and you know that the, the, the first day your model's in production, it, it will actually support a million requests, then you need to solve for that. But that is sort of a real problem that you have in front of you. And I would argue that maybe even in that case, I would at least have a pipeline run end to end that can accept one request before you work on that problem, just because you might learn things that you didn't know you didn't know, right? Um, so, so that's sort of the, the idea. And again, if you. If your brain is telling you that your problem is MLOps and you need to solve MLOps, then I would encourage you to sort of take that step back and understand which dimension is actually the dimension you're going to put under stress and start by solving for that. That's, that's sort of the, I hope that answers the question. Um, that, is, that is a good question. I think that if you, uh, in general, our approach for interviewing uh, people at DAGSUB is we want to get people uh, to work on problems that are closest to what they do in their day-to-day -day life. So I think if you know that Googling stuff is something that an engineer at your company, a data scientist at your company is going to do, then building sort of an example project where someone needs to learn something new uh, is a great way to do that. So a concrete example that we don't do but we did in the past was you need to, for like uh, front-end developers, right, uh, you need to design a web component with a library that no one has ever used because it's really, really obscure. So everyone has to learn. And then you sort of see that they can employ these tactics in, in sort of figuring out how to learn because it, it is also sort of time constrained. So if you try to just like read everything, that's not going to work. So practical tips for interviewing. Last question. I know we're right at time here. Are you hiring? And if so, where? Yeah. So we are hiring. Um, in a lot of places. Our core team is in Israel, but we're now hiring in the US and Canada and a bit in Europe as well. So if you're interested, positions like developer relations, community, development, design, a bunch of different roles exist all on the website. Uh, welcome to reach out to me. Happy to point you in the right direction. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>